Welcome, my friend, to Positive Church. If you would open your Bible at the very center, you'll find the book of Psalms. In it are the most beautiful words that have ever been translated into the English language. One of the most beautiful in Psalms is Psalms 23, that I know that you're probably familiar with. In Psalms 23, David describes God as being like a shepherd who cares for his flock. No wonder these verses have provided hope for countless generations upon generations. There was once a woman that I knew that was going through a divorce, and she focused so much on the loss that she hurt worse every single day. There was a man that I knew that was going through great difficulty, and he focused entirely, entirely on his problems until he couldn't sleep at all. Matter of fact, when I saw him, he had not slept in over a week. There was a woman who prayed for healing, and yet the majority of time of her daytime focus was upon her illness. When each learned the spiritual, wonderful gift of God, of rest in God, their lives dramatically changed. Let us talk about a gift to humanity that was given many years ago by the shepherd David. And I wonder if we have ever really received it, ever really comprehended it. My hope would be that today we truly receive this gift that has been offered. The most precious gift we can give to another person is not a gift that we buy with money, but a gift that is part of our soul, a part of our being, a part of that that we are, to share the experience and the depth of the spiritual experience that is taking place inside of us. Well, there was a shepherd boy named David, and he gave such a gift to all of humanity. It was of tremendous value to him, but more than that, it can be of tremendous value to us. Sometimes, when we have something that is valuable, we don't even realize it. It's as if we owned land and there was oil on that land deep beneath the surface, but because it was beneath the surface, we didn't realize that it was there. Maybe, in our own lives, it's our children. Maybe we don't value them in the way that we might. It could be a beautiful song. And we hear the song, but we don't hear the words that could uplift us. Or we don't hear the rhythm and the harmony of the song to touch us at the depth of our souls. Allow me today to share with you the 23rd Psalm. This is from the Revised Standard Version of our Bible. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
How many of you had to learn the 23rd Psalm in Sunday school? I bet a lot of you. Most of us have. It's part of our soul. Those beloved words in the Bible have become part of us. We are probably more familiar with those words than most others in the Bible, and they have sure been embraced by a majority of the population of the earth. But it has many facets, and today we're going to look at this in a way that you have probably never looked at it before. You probably had to memorize it years ago, and as a child, you probably resented having to do so. But today, we're going to look at it from a spiritual viewpoint. What we have in this psalm is a record of an individual's experience with the presence of God. This is what happened to David, who became the king. Now, my friend, it begins with, The Lord is my shepherd. It is God as shepherd, and us as the sheep. The shepherd is devoted to the care of the sheep. I think it speaks of God's caring nature for all of humanity. The universe has been devised in a way that we can be cared for. We may have had times where we didn't feel cared for. There may be experiences in our lives that have been hard for us, very hard to live through. But the truth of the matter is that our life has been devised in a way that we can feel that caring, loving spirit of God that never departs from our side. We have Jesus saying to us later, It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We have the prodigal son and the father who said to the son who stayed home, All that is mine is yours. In that parable, Jesus is saying, All that is mine is yours. Why is it then that we sometimes have accepted the belief that we are lacking many good things. How could we possibly be in need when we have this caring God? What is it that is being offered to us today? What is it that is ours? I think it is exactly as Jesus said, it is the kingdom of heaven that is ours. It has been offered to us. That is an awareness of the presence of God. When you look at the parables and the things Jesus said, like the kingdom of heaven is within you, and you put it all together, you come up with a calming, soothing, awareness of God. We have been created in a way that we can become aware of our Creator. And that is something very, very special. That's why we are called children, offspring of God. We can become aware of God's God in moments of ecstasy, we can become aware of God also in moments of tragedy. The amazing thing is that when we wake up, we are in that state of mind and heart in awareness. God can then pour through us, and God's good can be our experience and the experience of others when they are with us. There was a minister friend of mine years ago by the name of Bob Sicking. Now, before he was in the ministry, when he was in service to our country, he was in combat in Korea. 
and he told the story of an incoming artillery shell. He and his comrades threw themselves onto the ground. They heard it coming. The percussion went off very, very close by. When Bob got up, he was literally naked. While he was laying there, the percussion actually ripped the clothes off of his back. And when he tried to stand up, he just fell back down again at the ground. But the amazing thing is, not a hair on his head was harmed. He didn't even have a scratch. Now that is an example of God's help that can come in the worst of times. There is a spiritual awareness in us that helps, that allows that type of experience. There was a man and a woman during World War II in London. When the city was being bombed, this couple volunteered to be on watch every night. They would go to the shelters, but from there they would go to very high places that were quite dangerous. High places so that they could see out upon the city where the fires were. And then they would direct people to help put the fires out. In all those days of bombing, they were never harmed. They talked about the experience that they had with God. And the amazing thing is they had a little home in London. There was carnage and damage all around the home, but their home was never harmed. Not one window was broken or anything. They were asked about this and they said this, we don't really live in a house. We live in the house of the Lord, wherever we are. They lived, they moved, they had their being in the presence of God. It's not so much that God protected them. It is the fact that they lived in God, and in God there is no conflict. There is no carnage. There is no war. It's a state of mind and heart where they lived. Being aware of the presence of God brings a state of peace inside of you in any war zone that you happen to find yourself in. A war zone in the office or a war zone at home. The 23rd Psalm goes on to say, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The words I shall not want have taught me much in my own life. You see, this is a recording of an experience of the presence of God. When you have that experience, you are not in want. You have it all. Thomas Merton was a 20th century monk. And he said, a rich person has no needs. Now, he wasn't talking about lots of money. He was talking about being in a state of oneness with God, in which there is fulfillment and contentment. That is what happened to David. When the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I do not want. I can't want. The psalm goes on. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. During the heat of the day, the shepherd would make the sheep lie down in green pastures. They would be nourished in their rest. It would be moist there. It would be shady there. Is there anyone that is watching this that is experiencing right now the heat of life? I would say many. You couldn't have a body of people this great watching this and not have many experiencing what I call the heat of life. What is the normal human reaction to the heat of life? It is to run sometimes. 
Sometimes it is to act and do something. And in this example, during the heat of the day, what are they told? They're told to rest. The shepherd knows that power is in stillness. In rest is nourishment. That's when the ideas come. The guidance from God comes. We learn what to do and how to move ourselves through this experience, whatever it happens to be. He leads me beside the still waters. This is interesting. Sheep instinctively fear turbulent waters. Now think for a moment of why that is. They have all that fur. And if that fur gets wet, it gets heavy. It's hard to swim. My research has said that the shepherd would come to a stream, and you know what he would do? He would make a little dam. And in that place, there would be peace. In that place, there would be stillness. And the sheep could then safely come and drink from those still waters. They would feel safe. They would be nourished by the still waters. Think of the power of the dam. Where is that power? Is it in the water? Is it that water rushing over the spillway? Where is the strongest part of the dam? Is it at the top? No. It's at the base. That is where the force is. That's where the power is. And that is where there is stillness. There is a message in this for us. It is saying that the Lord is my shepherd and there is a state of contentment and joy. But the way to experience that is rest. It is in the still waters the stillness. Master Eckhart, the German spiritual teacher, said, There is nothing so like God as stillness. Now that's the key to experience God's presence in which we live and move and have our being. And then a spiritual portal is made in our awareness an opening so that God can pour forth into our lives. What happens when we are still and we rest? The next verse says, He restores my soul. That's what happens when we experience the presence of God. You see, the first verses are about the relationship with God. Those that I have just read to you are about how to bring that experience. Now, you're looking at what happens after you are restful, after you are still. Probably the greatest loss in our culture today is rest and stillness. It used to be that families would sit on the front porch at night outside every evening and be together and just be satisfied with being there. Now, we hurry from place to place. Jesus, he went apart for a while, and out of stillness and rest, his soul was certainly restored, and he was refreshed enough to live the life that he did. There is too much viewing of God as a fireman putting out fires in life. What we really need to do, and this is what a part of this psalm is trying to say to us, is to be still and rest and help God help us. Do you ever think about that? Helping God help us? Helping God to come through? 
we want to create and open the spiritual portal so the divine help can come through. We already have it. If we're willing to accept it, if we're able, we have it as a gift from God. But we must first rest in prayer to receive it fully. See, we're made that way. If we will but receive. A great illustration of this is the closed fist. And sometimes when you're facing problems, you'll close it tighter and tighter and tighter. Or your mind, with worry and fear, it's only when we relax and open up that we're able to receive. The mind, the fist, our life, it is the same. Now let me continue. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. We have a sense of guidance. This is saying to be still and let the guidance of God show you the path you are to go down. It will be shown to you. But there has to be first a relationship with God, the oneness with the shepherd. For his name's sake, names in the Bible meant more than just a name like my name is Chris. A person was named or a town or a place for their nature. There was a spiritual meaning behind the name. And the namesake of God, the nature of God, or when we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, it is in the nature of Jesus Christ. It is to do things in the nature of the one that would be our shepherd. Notice whose sake this is for. It is for God's sake. It says, He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. You are going to be blessed, that's a given, but I assure you, my good friend, the way God has devised the universe, it's never just, just for you. Even though that many times in human mind, in human life, is the way we approach it. We say, I want this blessing. I want this blessing for me. It is never the way of God. Because the blessings of God are not just for you, but for all those around you. It's one of the untold and mysterious ways that the good comes. And it continues pouring itself out to all life, touching those that are nearby. Something like this psalm is stretched forth over thousands of years to touch humanity. We feel it instinctively, and that is why we love it so much. Doesn't this way of life sound wonderful? You should think, wow, if I lived this way, gee, I wonder if I'd have any problems anymore. I, if I lived this way, probably I wouldn't have any problems at all. Well, that's not exactly what the next verse says. It says this, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. My friend, sometimes we think in religion, if I do all this right, I won't have any problems. Well, we all have problems, like everyone else. It's just part of of the experience called life. I don't think it shields us from problems, but it gives us something that allows us to move through the valley. <laughs> oh boy, this is important. To move through. 
it isn't that we are going to set up a tent, build a city in the valley of our problems, dwell in the valley of our problems. It is to move through. It has not come to stay. It has come to pass. We say, this too shall pass. It is gone. We move through it, and I think that is an all-important spiritual teaching. It's a shadow. That's the key. It's not permanent reality. It's not the way things really are in the reality of the permanent good of God. Now the human mind says the opposite. The human mind looks at the appearances that Jesus says and says, uh-oh, this is the way it will always be. I'm doomed. This is permanent. Be surprised how many people in counseling that have said that to me when they're facing some moment of a problem. You are uplifted when you come to God in prayer and you're taking hold of God's truth and taking hold of God's truth uplifts you and it will do it for a profound amount of your day. Let me ask you a question. If you are the sheep and there is a lion stalking your flock, what do you do? Do you give your attention to the tooth, to the claw, to the lion? Or do you put your attention on the shepherd? Which approach will dissipate the fear? Which will quicken the fear? If you put your attention on the lion, which many people do, it will quicken the fear. Do you know that there is scientific proof that the fear actually sends out a chemical that is smelled by the lion? And he is attracted to the fearful. My suggestion would be to put full attention upon the shepherd. That is a good way for you and me to approach life. We can focus upon the doctor's diagnosis. We can focus upon the lost job. We can focus upon the loss of love and the emotions that are temporarily sweeping over our soul in the valley of our problem. Or we can begin to give our attention to God. It says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And obviously in the psalm, the attention is not upon the lion. It's not upon the problem. It's upon the shepherd. God is with us closer than you or I could ever imagine. You have to experience it. It is true for you. It's true for me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. Do you know what the rod was? The rod was an iron-tipped club that was used to fend off animals or whatever the threat happened to be. And the shepherd carried this. Do you know what it represents? It represents the power to act. When you have that sense of oneness with God, there is a power to act and deal with whatever the problem happens to be. The staff is the stick with a hook on the top. It was used to prod the sheep and to guide them in a direction that they could go safely. That's the guidance that comes because we give our attention to God and not the problem. We have a sense of God's guidance and we come through the storm. The end result of this is deep soul comfort. God comforts us so that the fear dissipates. This is something you should not miss. 
The reason this happens is because we awaken to the presence of God. There must be a conscious awareness of oneness with God. There must be an awareness of God, and when that occurs, then all that God is, all that we are, begins to form together, rise up, and do the work that should be done. Now, verse 5 is very interesting because in verse 5, everything shifts. Here, God is no longer the shepherd. God becomes the host. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Let me explain this to you because it's rather fascinating. In biblical times, if you were in conflict with another person, one of the things that you might do is to put on the most incredible meal, a feast that you could ever imagine for your enemy. You would probably borrow dishes and things from your neighbors, try to get the best wine, even kill the fatted calf. You would put on one great party for this person. You would invite him to come and you would wait on him hand and foot with supreme service for this person. But here is the catch. This was part of the culture. The person had to give you the same in kind. In this case, who is putting on the party? Well, God. God has prepared the table. So there is an overwhelming on the case of the other party from any desire to harm you because there's no way that he can match the spread that you and God are putting on. And then it goes on and says, you anoint my head with oil. They burned oil in their lamps. It produced light. They anointed their kings with oil because they wanted them to be illumined. The Messiah actually means the anointed one. Let me ask you this. If you are waiting on someone hand and foot, and you've brought in all these things to prepare this scrumptious meal, you don't think of harming them in that moment. You are transforming spiritually. You think of serving them, and your hardened heart becomes softened a bit as you are serving this person. Your head is anointed, and you begin to perceive, as God perceives, in love. In other words, you begin to see in a different way. You begin to see them differently. Beholding God's good in another. That's what would happen. And then the cup would overflow. Where before you have a sense of emptiness about you. A sense of loss. Now you are being infilled and to the point of overflow. The flood stage of good, of happiness, of satisfaction. This is not because of something the person has done, but because of something you have done. Because you are serving. You are doing something beyond yourself, and a spiritual change takes place in you. May each have a relationship with God. And may we have the keys of how to nurture that spiritual relationship through stillness and through rest. And may we have guidance 
on how to deal with the problems of life. The key is that we must work out all of our animosity, our resentment, our condemnation for one another. Oh, the last verse. It holds the most incredible promise for humanity and what there is for us. It will never occur as long as we are in conflict with other nations, as individuals, and even a conflict in ourselves with the guilt that we hold inside of ourselves. Here is what is before us. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall live in the house of the Lord forever. How could that happen if you were in conflict with another? There is no way that it can occur. But that is the promise. And that promise is there for each one of us. Look at what is taking place now. We have moved from being the image of just sheep to being sons and daughters of God. We have lived outside the presence of God in our awareness. And now we are actually in the spiritual home. We had God outside of us, taking care of us. And now there is a merger, a oneness, a dwelling together, living in the house of the Lord forever by living Jesus' teachings the way that Jesus told us to. An awareness of God brings this kind of life, and it is our destiny. It's oneness with the Spirit of God, and it's true right now in this moment. We are one with God, as Jesus told us that we are. All that there is, is ready to pour itself into your life. And it matters not what your problem is. Or the sense of void that you have felt. It's all there, my friend, and it's waiting to help you. The kingdom of God is within us, but it is ours to awaken within our free will. And this is exactly what happened to David. How do you like David's message to us? For me, it is an incredible thing. I think of all the things written in the Bible, it is the reason it is the one that people hold on to. It is the one that we ask children to memorize. For me, it's very evident what a message it holds for you and for me. Would you like to hear it one more time? You've heard it before, and I venture to say, though, that you've never heard it in the way that we've talked about today. So when I share this with you one more time, it will be the first time that you have really heard it, at least in the context and the awareness of the presence in your awareness this very moment. Will you take a moment and pray with me? Let us pray. The Lord is my shepherd. Dear God, I pray that you're my shepherd, that you'll lead me, my thoughts, my actions, my walk, into paths that are right for me. I am willing, and I want you to be my shepherd. I shall not want. I know with you, God, that everything will be all that I ever desire. And I am ready to walk and be with you in my awareness, in my every thought inside of my human mind. God, 
makes me lie down in green pastures. God, help me to remember during the busiest of days to lie down and to rest and lead me to those places that replenish my soul in times especially when I most need it. God leads me beside the still waters. Help to lead me to the activity in life that is less rushed, activity in life that is not at the constant flood stage, at the emergency stage. Help me to relax beside the wonderful calming waters that replenish the deepest areas of my being. God restores my soul. I pray that every time I am aware of you, every time that I think of you, God, that I am restored. And not just as I was restored yesterday, that I am created into a new person, a new being, into a greater awareness of you. God leads me in paths of righteousness for God's name's sake. I pray that I always go in the right way, doing the right things. I pray that I am led to actions that are right for myself and for others. That I do everything in your nature. And God, at those times, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I pray that I will fear no evil. For I know without any doubt inside of my human mind that thou art with me. Thy rod and my staff, they comfort me. That I can know your protection. That I can know your safety. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. I pray that the banquet that you create is good for me and good for all those that I know, even those that are not exactly like me, even those that in human mind I have disliked before. Help me to see new things in them. Help me to serve them and be one with them. And do this through illumination. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup overflows. I pray that I am no longer empty inside, that I am fulfilled, that I am complete. And I pray that goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and God, that I shall dwell in your house forever. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. My friend, this was originally a three-part daily inspiration that we sent out over three days. The full script of this is on the new archives on our homepage of Positive Daily Inspiration. Click on the Classics button and you will find this. Also, I remind you, for those that are watching, that our Gratitude to God calendar is now available again until sellout, and you know it sells out every year fast because it changes lives.